Hi everyone, hey, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate this opportunity to connect with you, whether you're coming to me on Facebook or YouTube. I really count it a privilege. I want to be of help to you. I want to be a blessing to you. And I, I hope these messages are helpful and an encouragement. Um, if you have any questions about anything or um, you're having some struggles or you just want to talk, please let me know. Reach out to me and I'm so glad to help you in any way I can. Hey, those of you part of the Hillside family, I want to give you an update to our chair saga. Now, in a nutshell, our chair saga is that we ordered brand new chairs for the church, and the company we ordered them from went under, hit by a couple of hurricanes there in Texas where um, they had the freeze and the power outages and all that kind of stuff. Add COVID and pa the pandemic to the mix, and it was just too much for them, and the company went under. They did give us back our money, thankfully, but uh, we are now having to order them from another company. Well, that's going to cost us another couple of thousand dollars. Maybe that's why that company went under. They weren't charging enough for their chairs. But um, it is going to cost us another couple thousand dollars. And I know many of you have asked me, hey, how are we doing? And um, until that company went under, we were doing pretty well. But now we need, like I said, a couple thousand dollars more. So if you'd like to give, feel free to do that. You can mail it. You can do it online or whatever. Um, you, if you want to come in person, you can do that as well. But can I just say, I am so grateful for all of you who have been so faithful in giving, not just for the chair fund and all that, but during this whole pandemic, some of you have been just very, very faithful. There are, I crazy, but there are expenses even when we're not meeting. And so I really appreciate all of that. So thank you for your faithfulness. And um, I'm just, it's a blessing to me. I know you're not giving to me, you're giving to God, but it's just a, it's an encouragement to me. And I just want to say, say thank you. Um, hey, this week, we are in part two online in our series called Say. Now, what I'm doing is, is I'm recording the messages on Sunday and then playing them the following Sunday. So this is actually the message I preached last Sunday. And uh, eventually we hope to get, you know, in tune where it's, you know, on the same Sunday. But we're trying to work out the media. You know, in my backyard, I kind of had it down to a system. But uh, now we're making adjustments back at the church with lighting and video and all of that. So um, today's video isn't the quality I would hope it would be. Uh, and I apologize for that. But I just want you to know the message is there. You'll be able to see the points and everything. And I, um, I hope it's a help to you. But uh, thank you for your patience on this. And I'm really looking forward to having you hear this message on our series, Say, Part 2, and I hope you enjoy it. Before the message, eh, there's a fun little video as a bumper here. Hey, so, uh, you know I'm not great at these uh, intense conversations, you know? You know I care about you, right? I really care about you, too. <laughs> um, well, it's just like, Things have been changing. Change? You know, when a relationship, it, it can start as one thing, uh, but then become something different. Different? No. I will not be broken up with again. Let me help you out with your intense conversation. I sense anger. I had no idea you felt that way. Listen, 5'7 is a very adequate height. Saying in your parents' basement, that's a great way to save money. I am not cheap. I tried being vegan. Isaac Newton was 5'7. Those are my feelings being tap danced on. I had no idea you could be so hurtful. You sing all these mean things to me. And you don't like my music? I don't even know. Well, I think I've said it all. I don't even know. Do you have anything you'd like to add? <laughs> no reason I came here. <laughs> oh. <gasps> oh, congratulations, guys. Oh, you're speechless. That means you nailed it. Guys, can I take your picture? What a perfect moment. You know, I, I wasn't a pastor very, very long when I realized that I was not going to be able to wait and preach on subjects after I had, you know, captured them, after I had mastered them. 
Um, the topic that we're talking about in this little series, and I, I hope you'll forgive me, I'm going to add one more. I said two, but I'm going to add one more next week because it's just, um, there's so much great stuff to say. But um, this is a topic that I have struggled with all my life, ever since I was a little kid. You probably wouldn't believe that, but you know, in school, those of you school teachers, I was that kid who they couldn't get to stop talking. Um, you know how those teachers feel, don't you? Um, but um, I always, I also was a smart aleck, and I also was an arguer. My mom said I, she was the one who really planted in me the idea of being a lawyer someday um, when I was very young. And uh, so there's a lot of things that you know I struggled with with regard to my mouth. My master's thesis, my first master's thesis was on was on um, anger because that was something that I really had to you know struggle with. So I realized that I couldn't completely master. Uh, the, all of the topics I was going to preach on, but we know but it, that from what we talked about last week is that words are very powerful, and we are very powerful because we all have a mouth, and words can determine really the direction and the quality of our lives, but even more frightening than that perhaps is that they can determine the quality and the direction of other people's lives, and that's where it really gets, gets difficult. Here's a statement that um, is very familiar to you perhaps, it goes like this. It's not a Bible verse. It says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, I don't know who wrote that, but he was a complete idiot. <laughs> right? We have all been deeply hurt by words, and we have also deeply hurt with words. And, um, and we talked about this last week in James, how you know our, our tongues are just so little, just like the rudder on a ship, and yet they can turn the direction of our whole body, just like a bit in a horse's mouth can turn the whole horse, just this tiny little thing. And um, a lot of damage can be done. It's just like a one little match can, you know, blaze a forest fire. And our mouths are so dangerous that way. A few words, just a few words can be so dangerous. The first time I really recognized how dangerous, uh, you know, our mouths could be for me was in fifth grade. And, um, I can, I, I, I'm not even going to share the details of what I said because they were so cruel. There weren't a lot of words spoken, but they were so cruel. I think it might even trigger some, some, some emotion in you. And so, um, and I don't want you to hate me that much. So um, I'm not going to share with you exactly what I said. But um, my, my fifth grade teacher was sharing some, some things, um, getting very personal. And I made a comment back, and it made him cry. Yes, I said him cry. Um, it, was so, it was so cruel and so personal that um, he, I, I didn't even get in trouble for it. He it was just so overwhelmed. I remember feeling, in my, the next year in sixth grade, my parents sent me to a Christian school. Good move, parents. Um, I needed it. But um, I remember feeling so convicted about that. I went back to the school to visit him and um, I remember going on to just, you know, what's the chance? I was going on to the yard, you know, there, the playground, and as I walked in, he was on yard duty. And as he turned and saw me, I mean, I'll never forget the horrified look he had on his face. Like, oh no, he's back. So I went up to him and I talked to him and told him what I was doing and I asked him to forgive me. And, um, you know, we had a little conversation, whatever, and we parted friends. And um, I'm really glad and relieved I did that. But since then, to this day, I still look back on that and I think, is that one of those things, one of those interactions with a student that he never forgot. You know, that it always stayed with him. Um, we talked about this, how, how difficult it is. And even Jesus' brother James wrote in, the, uh, in his letter that, um, that our tongues are untamable. You know, we can control them. We can use, with God's help, we can control them. But we will always need to guard them. And the most encouraging things, you know, that people say to us, we remember, but the most discouraging as well. So, you know, on the flip side, what's the most encouraging thing somebody's ever said to you? Can you, can you think of that? Um, I hope you don't have to, um, have to, you know, rack your brain too much to figure out what, you know, which thing was the most encouraging to you. But, um, but maybe you can think of somebody saying something to you that perhaps impacted you, really, even to this day. Maybe it was something that you were told as a kid. I remember back when I was playing football, um, yeah... You didn't know that. I played football, you guys. Did you know that I played football? Um, <clears throat> it was City League Elementary School, flag football. Um, that was my football career, start and finish. And um, I'll never forget, um, it was one kind of on and off rainy day 
on Saturday. And there would have been some question about whether we had a game anyway. But I decided, you know what, I'm just going to show up and see what happens. And there I jumped on my bike, ran, you know, drove, rode all the way to Willow Pass Park in Concord, and there was the game. And um, much to my delight, hardly any of the kids showed up. So, you know, we were all guaranteed, I think, five minutes. in the, And so I didn't play much. You know, I think there were, there were a lot of times when my coach would say, oh, Cliff, I forgot about you, you know, whatever. But when I was in, it was like four minutes, 57, 58, 59. Cliff, out, you know, it was like just you know, counting down. And so I was never a great athlete. I was never even a good athlete. I would have been delighted to be mediocre at something, but um, never really was. So, but one Saturday, I found myself having to play this other team. And I was so, so happy about this. Well, by some chance, I was thrown a ball that I actually caught. And I took off running like a crazy man. And I don't actually remember if I, um, if I scored a touchdown. I probably would have remembered that if I had. But um, I remember the coach, after I came back off, he said, Clift, if I knew you could run like that, I would have, play, I would have played you more often. And I would, I'll never forget it. Where I am, what, you know, 107 years old now? And it's amazing how I can remember way back in grade school that encouragement that he gave, you know, that he gave me. Um, perhaps as a child, someone said something to you that really stuck with you and continues to be a reminder. We all remember some of those hurtful things, some of those things we wish we could put out of our mind, but we can't. And I also hope that you have some affirming statements. Um, I'll never forget a friend of mine saying to me in high school, uh, and we went to middle school together too, but I remember her saying, she said, she goes, one day you're going to be a, a great pastor like Chuck Swindoll. And many of you don't know who Chuck Swindoll is. Chuck Swindoll is my dad's age. I think he's in his 80s. But um, back then he was like, he was on the radio and so forth. Um, now, um, I did not live up to her expectations, by the way, <laughs> but it was really encouraging. In fact, the reason why I even started praying about going into ministry was because of the encouragement in my Christian high school of kids saying, you know, you'd make, you'd make a good pastor one day. Um, they were wrong, but here I am anyway, so you have to put up with me. <laughs> so, but really, it was that, those words of encouragement of different things I did in speaking. They said, you should do this. You should do this. And, um, and th that was such a, a, a help to me. Today we're going to hear from the Apostle Paul, who steps onto the pages of history as Paul, Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus, you know, way north of uh, Jerusalem. And he came to Jerusalem because he was very disturbed by this new knockoff religion, that's what it looked to them, off of Judaism, um, called the Way, you know, became known as Christianity, um, which was really, Christian was really a, a derogatory term. But he got permission to round up Christians and to arrest them, to punish them, and sometimes even there was, you know, they, they died for their faith. And, um, and Paul, Saul hated Christians, hated them. And then one day on his way to arrest some more Christians, God intervenes, a bright light shines down, Jesus speaks to him, and Saul becomes Paul and completely changes his life and becomes goes from a church hater to a church planter. He becomes a Christian. And he starts uh, churches all around the Mediterranean rim there, and he... Um, uh, those little port cities, as you follow kind of the map, you can kind of follow around where, where he went. And he started, but what he would do is he would plant a church, and then he would write them letters. Couldn't be everywhere, everywhere at once, no internet and all that, but he would, he would write letters, and God inspired many of these, and we have them in the New Testament today. And one of them that he wrote was in a, little, uh, was in a, a town called Ephesus, and he talks to Christians about a variety of things, and one of the things he talks about is their mouths, the way they talk. And so um, Paul, you know, last week, and I kind of mentioned this, James kind of left us hanging. He just kind of said, man, the mouth is dangerous, it's horrible to own one, you know, and that's it. Paul kind of helps us out here, and he, he moves us forward and guides us to use our words in a positive, productive way. Now, those of you, if you're, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're watching online, you're not a Christian, um, I, I can't expect you to, to obey these, anything I say or the, even, even what the Bible says, because, um, but if you are a Christ follower, we are obligated, we are accountable to this. This is what God has given to us as instruction. So, um, and, and again, if you're not a believer, hey, you can try this. Try this free at home, you know, um, simply because it's really great advice. But if you are a Christian, we are commanded to live by this. And so here's, here's this 
words of, of God, inspired by God, written by Paul, and he talks about a mouth. Now, Paul is writing to Gentiles who have left a pagan worldview to become Christians. And they, um, they, they're trying to understand what it means to follow Christ, especially in light of their background. Um, and their background was really difficult. So Jesus, they, they're, they're trying to follow Jesus. And here's what Paul writes to them. And the first part of this section we'll look at today really addresses that in general. He says, so I tell you this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. He's saying, when you were outside of the church, you had a worldview that matched the culture. Um, these Gentiles, which really was classifying anybody who was not Jewish, they, these particular ones believed in multiple gods. They were what we'd call pan, uh, you know, polytheists. Um, and, it, and it affected their behavior, it affected their beliefs, it affected how they, their worldview, um, how they acted. And, and in verse 18 it says, they and those, those uh, you know, you used to be like, they are darkened in their understanding. You know, they just, they don't get it. And are separated from the life of God. And then he tells us why. And this may sound offensive, but let me explain it. He says, he says, uh, they're, they're darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So he says, these people are interacting with a culture and they're ignorant because they've hardened their hearts. Now, that sounds like an insult. That's not the way they would have read it because of the way Paul worded it. He's basically just giving an observation. Um, he's saying the people you deal with in culture don't know any better because they, they can't see what you see. They don't understand. The Holy Spirit hasn't come in them. They don't view the world like you do. And the culture of Ephesus believed, again, in a pantheon of gods. And the Greek and Roman gods were all about themselves. It was all about what they could do. There, there was no moral standard. There was certainly no religious standard. Um, they used people. They slept with whoever they want. They, you know, created baby gods. They even, you know, participated in human sacrifices. I mean, anything went. And the bottom line in the polytheistic culture was it's all about themselves. That was the bottom line. The problem was that if everyone was a god and that everything was a god, then there was a lot of competition and there was a lot of tension there. It was really every man for himself. Now, this was also a culture where it was really a bummer to be a woman because women, women had you know, virtually no rights. Bummer to be a child because you, know, you were just hoping to survive and do your time. Might made right in this culture. Uh, you, you know, and it, again, it was very bad luck to be a woman, to be poor, um, to you know, be conquered. That was something also because it was a winner-takes-all kind of world. So where'd they get that idea? They got that idea from the gods that they worshipped. These, all these many, many gods, and that's the way they operated. So the Apostle Paul is talking to these people who grew up in this culture, and he says, you've got to do a, have, a, have a shift here. And he says, look, the, the world you came from is very, very different from the world I'm asking you to be a part of, that I'm introducing you to as a Christian. Very different. And, and, and your family and your friends that are still in this world, uh, it's going to be a very different real worldview than what you're going to experience. And then he says in verse 19, having lost all sensitivity, they, they have given themselves over to sensuality. It was really an anything goes mor moral. Again, no religious morality or whatever associated with paganism. He says, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, again, you know, and there's a, there's a, we could say, there's a morality associated with Christianity. Now, let me make it very clear. Being moral doesn't make you a Christian. I know a lot of good moral people who are not Christians, but Christianity will and should definitely affect your morality. It affects the way we treat people. It affects how we treat our spouse, how we treat our family, how we treat our neighbors. It's, you know, our every, everything. Um, our faithfulness in marriage, all these things. But in the pagan religion, there is no morality. There was no gauge with regard to, to behavioral expectation. And Paul says, the reason people in your culture behave this way is because they're living with a worldview that, you know, they don't, where they don't have any guidelines. They don't know anything, you know, other than look out for themselves. And he's saying it's not a criticism. It's just really an observation that he's giving. And it says, and they are full of greed. It's winner takes all. Uh, and if you're poor, again, if you're poor, if you're a woman, if you're a child, it's just really, you know, that's too bad. Verse 20, that however is not the way of life you learned. 
That's the, that's the world you live in, but that's not the life you've been invited to. When you heard about, G, about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, this, and this may sound strange, um, and I hope you'll follow me in this, but everybody, especially those of us in the Western world, really have to, have to give thanks and appreciation, be grateful for Jesus, for the Apostle Paul, and for the early church, because it was really, it was that really early first century church that was advocating for what we take for granted, uh, what we just assume. Like what? Um, we assume that all people have individual rights. Uh, we assume that women should be treated with dignity um, and should be treated the same, with the same respect as men, um, that the poor should be treated you know, and valued just as much as, as, as rich people, um, that we, as, we assume that sexual harassment and sexual abuse and all of that is wrong. See, all of that that we see is leftovers of teaching that resulted from Christianity, from that impact on that first century. In fact, if you look at the, the really throughout the world today, I mean 2021, the dignity of individuals is most pronounced in countries in our generation that were impacted by the message of Christianity. And that's not true in every country. You know that. Um, we've seen that. Not every country on this planet values the individual. But in cultures where it is, and you're thinking primarily where, Europe and, and the U.S., that have been impacted by Christianity, um, that's, and by the way, that's not to say that all the people in those countries are Christians. We know that, just like in America, not everybody's Christian. But it's that Christianity has impacted the entire Western world, and one of the ways it did was by bringing this idea. Again, men and women, children, poor, rich, they're all made in the image of God, and they all have value, Jesus died for all of the world, for every single individual person. And there was no hierarchy this way. And so when Paul wrote this, this was not the assumption. See, it's very easy for us in our world to say, well, of course, you know, you know, this is wrong. That wasn't the case here. Women were used as property. Children were, you know, could be sold. It was, it was a time when culture was like, it's all about me and what's going to benefit me. And Paul's advocating, again, for what we assume. And amazingly, it worked. When, when, isn't it amazing? Those of you who are Christians, Christianity actually works. Um, the reason was that the Western world thinks and values you know, we, what we do. The reason is that it is really the impact of Christ's message, of the gospel, of what the Apostle Paul spread throughout the world, as well as uh, the early church. And that's just amazing. So that's kind of a little free sideline. But to, I mean, every single person, whether a person's a Christian or not, should be grateful for the impact that Christianity has had on the planet. Well, in verse 22, it says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life when you you know, were a polytheist, worshiping all the gods and acting all crazy, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. He says, when I first came to you, when I first visited Ephesus, he said, remember, I told you that you needed to take off some of the old ways. You needed to put off some of those old ways. And those old ways of thinking, those ways of behaving. So, so don't be fooled by your deceitful desires. Now, we've all experienced deceitful desires. Um, what are deceitful desires? We, we, maybe we just didn't know what to call it. We don't say, well, I had a deceitful desire. A deceitful desire is a desire you have that promises you something, but doesn't fulfill that promise. Um, so we've all chased di desires like that. We've chased a desire. We, we, we got what we wanted. We got who we wanted. And we thought, oh, this is going to be so wonderful. This is going to bring this. It's going to bring that. It's going to bring happiness and joy and peace finally or whatever. And then it doesn't. Then when you, you, you didn't get what you promised, then what happens is you hear a little whisper. It whispers to you, next time. Next time, it gives you excuses. Hey, it didn't work out this time because she, you know, didn't work out this time because he, because they, whatever, they, you know. But Paul says, as Jesus followers, we're called to take off all of that and live a completely different life. Now then, he says, once you take all that off, he says, what, then what happens? To be made new in the attitude of our minds and to put on the new self created to be like God. And that's an important phrase because the pagan society, people acted like gods, Paul says here, he says, when you embrace this new world view, you won't be like gods. You'll be like God. 
capital G, who invites us to address him as Heavenly Father. Who, God who loves us so much that he sent his only son to come and to die and to be buried and to rise again and to pay for our sin. That's the God I want you to be like. God isn't going to toy with us like, you know, gods would do. And those of you who remember, remember back in school, you know, taking those classes, studying about them, you know, it's like people were always afraid they were going to get, you know, used by them. Here's God who loves us perfectly and wants us to call him Father. And he says to put, put on that, that new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. And not the kind of holiness that pulls back, but the kind of holiness that God has that reaches out, that reaches out to us and wants to have a relationship with us. And Paul shares his, his new life, and he gives us some practical help, and I'll point that out in just a minute. But he gives us very er- different areas, and one of those is the way we talk. So as they're shifting in their worldview and in their mentality and all of that, there are some things that, he, that are going to affect the way they talk. And in verse, um, and I want you to think of it as, as you're going to look at this and we read this, it's kind of like it's like a funnel where he's going to de- deal with some broad things, individual things, and it's going to come right down to the very core of what the issue is. So uh, you can follow me on that. But um, here's how he kind of applies this big picture of this. He gives them some illustrations before focusing on the real issue. Uh, again, uh, he says in verse 25, therefore each of you, must put off falsehood, lying, and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So, again, being angry isn't a sin. Um, But how we manage it certainly can be. And do not give the devil a foothold. And by the way, the devil's going to exploit anything that you give him, you know, yeah, especially the way we talk um, and, and anything we let uh, get out of control. He'll grab control. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Now, in a culture that says it's all about me, stealing was just a given. And he's saying, hey, that you are you're got to think differently now. Um, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Again, a culture like this, there was no sharing. There was no big deal. This was something that was so countercultural when the church got started and people were helping each other out and worshiping each other's houses and eating together and praying together. It's like, what is with this? All this sharing stuff really went against the culture of, hey, it's all about me. And then he says, that you know, you work hard, do something that they may have something to share with those in need. And th- this is then he gets really to the core of the issue. He says, "Do not let any unwholesome talk." And that word "talk" is the word um, some of you may be familiar with the Greek word "logos." Logos was the word for word. And um, the most, but I think the most interesting word is this word unwholesome. He says, don't let any unwholesome word. And the Greek translated unwholesome is really interesting. And in our English, it'd be a word that's used for, for rotting fruit or for um, just p- picture a pile of fish rotting, you know, that stench and smell and, you know, very undesirable looking, you know, grossness, um, just that deterioration and all that. Completely distasteful. Paul says, when you think about your words as a Jesus follower, um, who looks at everyone as an, someone made in God's image, every, someone that God loves, don't let distasteful words come out of your mouth. And Paul doesn't just say, make sure you tell the truth. They, they, the pagans knew you were supposed to tell the truth, even though they didn't. But everybody knew that they were you know, supposed to tell the truth. But even though pagans knew that, they didn't guard what they said. See, and, he, and, he, and Paul says, guard your mouth so that nothing distasteful comes out of your mouth. So it's kind of like, you know, fish mouth, right? Beware of fish mouth. Um, that's a good uh, image I wanted. I found that picture. I thought, uh, we got to throw that up there. So, okay, that's, so, so we have to kind of think of it. And what he says, when he says, don't let any other, you know, unwholesome words come out of your mouth. What's interesting about that is it's like, we're in charge. It's like, it's like we've got a gate and, and we have a, Oh, and we're the gatekeeper of our words that come out. So we have to be on guard. And when something distasteful comes, mm, we, have to, we have to be the, the gatekeeper to that. And, um, and so that's that first point. The first helpful point that I think Paul really points out is this, is that we avoid rotten words by guarding our mouth. Um, now that's the, that's the negative side. Here's what not to do. You know, again, he's he's funneling this source of all of it, and we're going to come down to that. And he says, you know, 
Don't do all, don't allow these words. Be that gatekeeper. And we avoid those rotten words by guarding our mouth. He says, resist that. They're going to rush the gate. And by the way, rotten words, unwholesome words are going to rush our gate every day. It's going to be a daily thing. We can't ever let this down. But, he says, as you're checking your words at the gate and the only words that you're letting out are those that are wholesome, he says, he says but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Now, this verse, you know, when you read that part, it sounds so nice and sweet and spiritual and all that, you know. And, and for some of you say, yeah, and it sounds very unproductive as well. Um, I mean, can you really live like this? I mean, parents, think about it. Can you really raise kids this way? Oh, sweetie, it's really not nice for you to hit your newborn sister with a hammer, honey. You know. I, I mean, right? Can we can we really do this? I don't know. Is it? Isn't there some urgency that we can have here? But it sounds, you know, for so it sounds so sweet. Bosses, you know, performance reviews, right? Hey, you know. You're not doing that great of a job, but do you mind just coming and showing up maybe a couple of times a week, you know, whatever, and maybe logging in when you're supposed to, you know? And if you could be mm, on time, oh, I don't know, half the time? I don't know. Is that too much? Right? You, uh, the business would never, would never work, right? Something we have to really understand, and I, this is something I got very convicted of because my kids, if they... When I, the, with the way I talk, if they ever accuse me of something, they say, Dad, you are too nice. Like All three of my girls have said that over the years. Dad, you're being too nice. Um, and that's what Paul's point is. Paul's not saying, be nice. He's not saying, be nice. That's not, that's not his point at all. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, be helpful. See, sometimes being helpful means saying hard things. Now, while some of you, okay, so this is there's probably a couple groups. One of you need to, some of you need to dial it down, <laughs> right? And some of you need to step it up, you know. Be, but it's all for the sake of being helpful. Our words are to be helpful according to the person we're talking to. That's he makes it very clear that way, according to their needs. Um, helpful. Then, then he gives a fantastic picture, and he gives us a construction word here. And he says, you know, it's helpful for building others up. It's almost like this. Imagine every single conversation you have, every interaction with, with people is a construction site. It could be an emotional, spiritual, relational construction site. And when you go onto that site, you have building material. And you can either use that. I mean, every single word is a tool or a building material. And you can either come into that conversation and leave that having built that up or taken it down or just load it on them. See? Um, so he's saying, when you leave the conversation, it's better off that you leave that having built them up. Can you imagine what, our, what would happen in families and relationships and marriages and churches and businesses, that, you know, Christian organizations or whatever, that would take this and just say, I'm going to use every conversation I have as an opportunity to build. Now, does this mean that there won't be some hammering and sawing? But then, like, you know, it's not just about being nice. It's about building each other up according to their need. And I think, and he says, the point is, you're building others up so that they'll be better for it. It's according to their needs. That's hard. Because when, many times when we talk to people, I'll just say for myself, many times when I talk to people, I'm, I'm really concerned about getting my point across, my opinion across, making sure they understand me, and, and so forth. But Paul makes it very clear, that isn't the way of Jesus. It's not, that's not the gospel. That's not Christianity to just be out there for you. For God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave. In conversations with other people, we should look for opportunities to use our words in a way that helps them, builds them in what they need. It says that it may benefit those who listen. He makes it really clear. Um, not for those who are talking. We and again, I like to tell my story. I want to tell my opinion. Um, and I want to get my word out. And our Heavenly Father comes and says, David, that's, that's all about you. This isn't all about you. Um, that's the way pagans live, looking out for themselves. That's not the way God has for us to live. And that's not how your Heavenly Father has taught you. Then he says, while, while we're talking about it, when it comes to your words, he says, do not grieve and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I don't know if you've ever been, those of you who have kids, have you ever been with your kids? And if you have kids, the answer to this is yes. I haven't even asked the question. Have you ever been with your kids and they said something that embarrassed you? 
You said, yeah, that's called parenting. Yeah. Um, I remember, I wasn't going to share this, but it's such an awesome example. I know she wouldn't care. Brittany, when she was little, had really chubby cheeks. And she loved them. This was a trophy for her. And so she would point out to people, point out to, you know, all the family, those who also had chubby cheeks. So look, Daddy, he has chubby cheeks and she has chubby... Most people were really, you know, quite good about it. But, um, you know, it's like, oh. But then there were those times when things were really hurtful. And I want you just to, you know, sometimes we, we make the Holy Spirit a force and realize the Holy Spirit's a person. It's the third person of the Godhead. So, you know, but I can picture us grieving the Holy Spirit by saying something. And then, and the Holy Spirit going, oh, I can't believe you just said that. I have been doing a work in that person's life. I have been building them. I've had people surrounding them. And then you came in and you said that. In that whole context of the way we talk, don't grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, you're God's property. They used to seal things to, you know, de- designate when it was, you know, wh- whose property it was. And, um, and, and that's the way it was. You are sealed. The Holy Spirit presence in you is like a seal that says, hey, I belong to God. And God has made this unconditional promise to us and has pledged his unconditional love to us. So, why would we make our love and our, our com- commitment to people so conditional? And then, it, and then it's like Paul pauses because he senses that people are going to struggle with this, and they're going to struggle in, you know, and have no control over it. Um, it's really going to be a struggle that they don't know what to do with. And Paul goes for the heart of why many of us struggle. And it sounds like he's changing the subject, but he's really, I think, going to the heart of the whole matter. Why is it that we let things escalate? Why do I say things and then walk away and later go, man, why did I say that? Wow, I wish I could take those words back. He says, get rid of all bitterness. Now, the phrase get rid of doesn't mean stop. What, get ri- what it means is that word means to pack it all in. You get a garbage sack, you stuff it all in, you wrap it up, you take it, you seal at the top, you take it out to the, to the driveway, you stick it out on the you know, street, and you leave it there, get rid of it, pack it up, get rid of it, it's out. It's kind of like what we do with the trash, kind of like we do you know, when we get junk in the garage, when we're cleaning out the attic or the basement or whatever. We're t- taking up, we're packing up, and we're getting it rid of it. He says, get rid of it. Because bitterness shows up, not only in what we say, it shows up in how you say it, in how I say it, in what, you know, the the topic, what I bring, and who I say it to. And so that's an important fourth point is this, is that you can't be a builder if you're bitter. We could make a tongue twister out of that if we tried, but anyway... You can't be a builder if you're bitter. Why? Because your bitterness will seep through the words and sometimes it's the volume and the tone and the attitude and all of that. Um, a couple of things about, about this is that when we feel this, when we were having this bitterness, it affects the content and the intent of everything you say. Um, so what can we do with that? It affects the content and the intent of everything we say. When we have this bitterness, what is the solution to bitterness? And here it is. The solution to bitterness is forgiveness. Bitterness requires forgiveness. Um, for most of us, think about it. Why, how does this, what does that have to do with words? For most of us, bitterness came from words that were spoken to us. Uh, about us or over us or whatever. It you know, was really, I mean, a lot of it was words. Yes, it could be physical things as well, but uh, maybe you lived in a home where you never got a positive comment or a compliment or, or anything um, you know, from your mom or dad or, or whoever you lived with or whatever. If there was anything that was positive, it was always with a little bit of an edge or some sarcasm or whatever, and you just never felt like that. Maybe you came into a marriage and you just didn't feel like you know, after a while you couldn't do anything right. And words were used to put you down and put you down. And words just kind of took away really what you should have been able to hold on to. So your self-esteem and your respect and your reputation and your time, all of those things, words began to steal that. So when we come into a new relationship, we come into a new season of life, and I think all of us are kind of sensing that, hey, we're ready for a new season after all the craziness we've been through. This is kind of a world you know, thing. 
But we bring all of that, all that shrapnel from the past in, and it really affects the way that we, that we live now. And it can affect our tone, and it can affect our words, and it also affects what we refuse to say because, just because of pride. Um, people wrestle with bitterness. There are really, I think they're really trying to pay back um, people who you know, did something but they're doing it by taking it out on people who did nothing, who've just been there. Um, and people who haven't done anything in your life can't pay you back for something and another wound that somebody else gave you. Um, so Paul gets very personal because he knows that we can't be a builder while we're bitter. So this is kind of a long statement. I don't know if I put this in your notes or not, but... Here's, here's forgiveness, in a sense, in this relationship, in the context I'm sharing it. Forgiveness is giving someone from the past what they don't deserve so that you can give to those around us what they do deserve. Again, you've seen this. You've seen, they say, hurt people, hurt people. People who have been hurt as a child, many times, I mean, it's, they take it into their marriage, and it just becomes difficult. When I do premarital counseling, I tell, them, I tell husbands, wives to be, I say, look, just remember, you're not marrying your spouse from this point on. You're marrying all of it. Okay, you're marrying the whole life. So if something happens as a child, something difficult happened as a teenager, while they were in college, whatever, you are, you're, you're marrying all of that. So understand that, um, because that's so vitally important. And again, sometimes we take that in. Um, I've seen parents who've made their kids pay for something that someone else took from them. Um, and it's really, it's really difficult. If you're a parent, single parent, second, third marriage, whatever, um, we have to deal with our bitterness. Because again, I've seen, I've seen parents do this. Uh, but Paul isn't done yet. He, he isn't done. He says, get rid of rage, and that's outbursts, you know, that, that actually comes from the word to burn, and anger which is the impulsive, uh, vengeful, anger kind of thing. Brawling, that's basically just yelling. Um, you, none of you guys do that, so that's good. And slander, uh, which, is, which is really verbal abuse. Um, that's what he's talking about. Along with every form of malice. And this is just, malice is just the desire to hurt people, to hurt others. Um, and you've met people like this. You just feel like, wow, they are just out to tear everybody apart. Many times, that is a wall or a safety net so because they have hurt from the past and they're going to take it out on anybody they see. Here's how, and let me just say this, get rid of words, these kinds of words, and this is a general category and you really have to kind of think this through how you would live this out yourself, but get rid of words that demean, uh, you know, it's kind of communicating that you don't really, they don't really matter, you know, with, which God would very much disagree with, of course. <laughs> he did that. He illustrated that, of course, by you know sending his son. Um, you know, it's like, hey, that's what demean means. You don't mean that much to me, D- or to degrade. You know, you don't make the grade. Um, you get graded down. You don't measure up. To which God would say to me, would say, David, okay, um, did you measure up to my standard? I'd have to say, well, of course, no. Well, how did I respond to you when you didn't measure up to my standard? How, how did that work for you? Well, you forgave me and you did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Exactly, that's right. I want you to go and do that for other people. That very thing. Never speaking degrading words over anyone your heavenly father died for. I, I know that's, I don't hope that doesn't come up as cliche, but don't do, don't say anything degrading about anybody that Jesus died for. You say, well, Jesus died for the whole world. Well, okay. Third is dis- disrespect. Disrespect means just communicating you're not worthy of my respect, you know, to which God would say, look, he or she may not be worthy of your respect, but they're worthy of mine. She's my daughter. She's my son. And Paul says, this is completely different way of thinking, isn't it? It's different worldview. You have not been called to treat people the way they treated you. You are called by God to follow Jesus, to treat people in the way that God in Christ has treated you. Um, and, and Paul, what does that look like? Give me something that I can really grab onto. He goes, okay, here it is. Be kind. And again, he's not saying avoid the hard things. Um, some of the most unkind things that I have done to people have been to not be honest with them. You know, um, 
there, that's where my struggle is, back on the being too nice kind of thing. Um, and, and that sounds so sweet. It's kind of like saying, you know, you're a, you're a workaholic. There's kind of this pride back in the back of your mind, like, I'm a workaholic. I'm so, I work so hard. I'm a workaholic, you know. And we think that that's, you know, a positive, that's not a positive thing. To be, to be so nice that you're unclear and dishonest, I mean, that's a terrible way. And it's not even nice to be that kind of nice. So um, anyway, that was a little message to myself. Thanks for sitting in. And um, it's, che- it's cheaper than therapy, believe me. So anyway, that helps me. But uh, he says, be kind. He says, even if you've got to say the hard things, and comp- how, f- how far do we go with this? And compassionate to one another. It's not just what we say. It's dialing into the emotion of the people we're talking to and making sure, he says, you're forgiving each other. Why? Because if you don't forgive, it's going to it's going to impact the way you talk to each other. Um, yes, Paul, but how far can we take this whole forgiveness thing? I mean, really, and this, this has come up before. But he says, just as, there it is, just as Christ, God forgave you. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. That's that's the limit. Okay, when you when you're forgiving more than than you know then Christ forgave you, then, you know. <laughs> and that's not going to happen, is it? This is what we would call the platinum rule. You've heard of the golden rule. Do unto others as you have others do unto you. I think this is the platinum rule. The platinum rule says, do for others what God in Christ has done for you. There it is. Um, now let's put that in the context of us talking about talking. How, what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. How about if we speak to others as God in Christ has spoken over us. Um, imagine what could happen in our relationships if we did this. If we did this and then we messed up, we would go back, we would own it, we would, you know, and we would allow God's grace to be a part of this and to shape us and to form us. And because everything you and I know, this isn't going to go perfectly. But view every word as building material and how we're going to use it. Now I'm going to read back through this whole passage. <clears throat> I just want to do it, you know, without, because I interrupted myself a lot here. I kind of walked through this whole thing. But what I want you to do is I want you to ask two questions as I do that. And um, these are just personal, practical questions. And the first one is, ask yourself, where do I have, you know, where do I have work to do? You know, what areas of my life? Where do I have work to do? And now, the second question is a little more painful, and that is this. Who hopes I'll get to work soon? <laughs> you don't have to look at them if they happen to be here, okay? But um, who really hopes, you know, it's like, yes, you know. Um, now, I hope you're listening for yourself, but you may be sitting next to those that you are closest to. See, what's sad about number, number two, and I've said this la- I said this last week, it's those closest to us that we tend to hurt the most with our words. Um, because we just think, oh, they'll understand, or we feel the safest and all of that kind of stuff. The, 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 the beneficial side of that becomes the negative as well. Um, it's, it's, it, and we tend to hurt them, which means, really, when I say I, we tend to hurt them, it's my problem. If, if you're someone who is really easily critical, please know that no one has ever had their life built by pure criticism. Um, Dad's sarcasm about, you know, it won't toughen up your son. It may toughen up the relationship so that it's hard, tougher for you to connect with them. Um, same with moms with daughters, you know, um, just being sarcastic. And there's, a, there's a, I think, a fun kind of sarcasm, but many times we're guilty of that painful, cutting sarcasm. So here's the section again, asking those, those questions to yourself. Ephesians 4.29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. That's a lot. Where do we start? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, <clears throat> if, if you are so inclined, I, I want to encourage you. I recommend you commit verse 29 to memory. Do not let any unwholesome you know, talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for the building up. Even if, you, even if you have to start off, 
Don't let any unwholesome words come out of your mouth. Start there. But just having that in your memory, you know, it will. And by the way, again, if you're not, if you're watching this or you're here and you're not a Christian, let me just say, um, applying these principles God's given to you, it will make your life better and it will make you better at life. It won't make you a Christian. There's nothing we do to earn or deserve what Christ did for us on the cross. But let me tell you, it can be helpful. Um, it'll make you a better husband, it'll make you a better wife, better parent, um, better friend, better boss, employee, whatever. And you, you, you may be trying to get someone else to pay back a debt that, that they don't even owe. And I, I want to encourage you, if, that's, if that resonated with you when I mentioned that, <clears throat> you might want to just take you know, a time this week, take a real live piece of paper, a real you know, physical live piece of paper, and write down, and then just say, what was taken from me that I am trying to get other people to pay back to me? What, what was taken from me that I'm trying to get other people to pay back for me? I would encourage you, take that, write it down, spend some time on it, maybe even a project, and then, after that, you really feel that's completed. Why don't you take it, wad it up, pack it away, and take it out to the trash and get rid of it, just like Paul said. Now, that's not a magical thing, that physical, you know, but in your mind, that may help you emotionally just say, that's what I need to do. Take that. Now, I've mentioned all this, and I said even to those who aren't Christians that, hey, this is really, really helpful, but let me just say, but from experience, trying to guard my mouth without Christ in my life doesn't work well at all. <laughs> you lose your power. Yeah? God wants to help us with, with, with this. And so the truth is, is that we can talk, you know, be wonderful at talking and be very kind in our words and all that, but that's not going to make us a Christian. That's not going to allow us to be in God's family. Jesus did what allows us to be in God's family. I love that, and I almost highlighted it, but you know, with time. But um, with in, in John, when it says, "In the beginning was the Word," I mean, the very essence of the message, the very essence of Jesus came with a message to us, and it was a message of kindness and forgiveness and hope. And it wasn't about anything we did or could do. It was about all, all about us. It was about Him taking that debt that He didn't owe, and He was taking that on Himself for us. Just kind of like we try to do with others. We try to make other people pay for you know, what other people have done to us. Jesus took our sin on him. And if you don't know that for certain, I know many of you probably do, but if you don't know that for certain, today is the day to make sure you know him. Um, today is the day of salvation. While you still have breath, and even in this COVID thing with your masks and all that, while we still have breath, it is, t- it is the time for God reaching his grace out to you. It's time to accept him. And if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to accept him today. And, um, and as we close, why don't we just bow? I, I want us to close. And um, I'd like to just lead if those of you who don't know for certain that you're a Christian. I would love to lead you in a prayer. Um, similar to what I pray, and this isn't a magic prayer, this isn't something that, you know, you recite this or memorize this and you're in. This is just us expressing our faith to God, that we're saying, yes, Jesus, I thank you for dying for me, being buried and rising again, and today I accept what you did, and I come and I give you my life. He gave his life for you and for me, and uh, we can give our lives to him and he will forgive us and allow us to be in his family. Not because we're good, not because we talk nice, but because of what Jesus did. If you'd like to do that, just pray with me. Just say something like, Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to suffer and die for me. I believe he rose again and is alive today. Today I invite Jesus to enter my life. Thank you for paying for my sin. I accept your forgiveness and trust in you. Thank you for making me your child. 
and for being my Heavenly Father. Help me to grow in my relationship with you and follow your leading each day. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let me pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this help and this direction in your word about how we're supposed to talk to each other. This is, for, for many of us, we do this every day. We talk every day. And God, we need your help. We need your strength. Help us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, as we've just read, but to be able to be a builder in the lives of others. Lord, there's a lot of people these days, especially after this year we've had, there's people who are scared, there's people who are nervous, there's people irritated and angry. And Lord, when we can come into their lives and we can be a builder, we're so grateful for those opportunities we have. But we know we can't go if we're bitter. And we just ask, Lord, that you'd help us to, to wrap up, to pack up, and get rid of those things that are keeping us from being all that you want us to be, to be to communicating all that we should be communicating. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be the, the dads, the husbands, the fathers, the, the friends, the, the church members, the community members that you really want us to be and that our words will reflect you well. Those times when we need to forgive, help us to forgive through your forgiveness, that we can forgive with that same forgiveness that Christ gave to us. Oh, we're so grateful for this opportunity. And thank you again for this morning that we could be together. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that message was a help for you. I know it was for me personally just preparing for it, just studying and preparing. Um, it's, a, it's an area I struggle with. I think we all do a little bit, but I, I know that I certainly do. And I want you to know, if there's any way I can be of help to you and encouragement to you, you want to talk to somebody, maybe you prayed that prayer that I gave there at the end to accept Christ as your Savior, and you got some questions. Maybe you didn't, and you've got some questions. Hey, feel free to reach out to me. I, again, want to be of any help I can be. I want to encourage you in your spiritual walk with God, and I just want you to know I'm here for you, and I'm so grateful that you've tuned in today. Hey, again, thank you so much. I count it a privilege, and I'm looking forward to sharing this message, part three, next week online. I hope you'll you'll stay tuned. Uh, that's the last of the, this series, and I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. In the meantime, I hope this finds you well. Take care and God bless.